we never talked about the game either. Everyone's like, oh, did you guys talk about the plan? I was like, heck no. <laughs> like, <laughs> if we're talking about the plan on Wednesday before the game on Saturday, after we've run through three weeks of training camp, like something's gone horribly wrong. Hello, welcome to Always College Football. Today is Wednesday, August 31st, just less than 24 hours away from September getting underway, which means leaves are turning and football is in the air. Really appreciate you being with us. Wherever it is you're consuming the content, that's on ESPN's YouTube channel. If you're here with us via the podcast on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts, please like, rate, and subscribe. Helps us out helps the show out, and we really appreciate the interaction that we've had with you through the first 37 episodes. I'm Greg McElroy. Along with me, as always, is Mark Kubiak. We have a great game plan in store for you today as we ask 10 questions that we want to get answered here in week number one of the college football season. And, of course, we're going to talk about the backyard brawl, maybe some massive changes in the state of Oklahoma. Plus, we're going to give you a couple stats that you might have to hear to believe. I was a little shocked myself when I first came across a couple of these stats. So without much further ado, let's talk about it. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Good year, more driven. All right, let's talk about it. These are the 10 questions that we want answers to when we put a bow on week one of the college football season. Now, these are going to range through Sunday. More on Clemson and Georgia Tech on Monday, okay? So if you don't hear anything about Clemson and Georgia Tech, don't worry, we're going to get there. We're going to take it one step at a time. So this will be a staple that we'll use throughout the college football season. The 10 things that we want to learn. Let's start today with the 10 questions. So, Coops, let's kick it off. All right. Number one, can Graham Harrell and JT Daniels spark West Virginia's offense against Pitt? Let's start with who Graham Harrell is first. We'll get to JT Daniels in a moment. Now, Graham Harrell was at USC, previously at North Texas, previously at Washington State with Mike Leach. He's an air raid guy. And just look at the numbers, statistically speaking, from USC the last couple of years. Now, you look at 2019, it was kind of a funky year because JT Daniels got hurt in the first game. Keaton Slovis had a great year. But the numbers really in the last couple of years tell you all you need to know. Last year, USC led the Pac-12 and was 17th nationally in passing offense, but one issue with their raid system, because they don't run the football, that red zone offense is usually not quite as good, maybe as some of the open field offense, but that wasn't the case for Graham, Car Graham Harrell. Their red zone offense scored at a 92% clip, which was pretty dang good. They were 20th in third down conversions. They were 24th in total offense. And Drake London, the outstanding wide receiver who became a first-round pick, was named the Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year. Go back to 2020. Passing offense ranked 11th, nationally first in the Pac-12, at 320 yards a game. And Keaton Slovis made all Pac-12 first team while ranking in the top 20 in completions, passing yards, total offense, and completion percentage. So if you look at what Graham Harrell has done traditionally the last couple of years, he knows how to get the most out of his quarterback spot. Well, the quarterback that's taking this reps this year for West Virginia is JT Daniels. He's no stranger in college football, but his best football might have been on display the last four games. We're going to use that four-game cut at Georgia of the 2020 season. He had 80 completions in the four starts and threw for over 400 yards and four scores against a quality Mississippi State defense. He also went on to play well against Cincinnati, who we all know was a really good team as well that year there in the bowl game. But JT Daniels has had his fair share of issues staying healthy. He's going to have to be smart this week, too, going against a really good pit pass rush. However, Graham Harrell, I don't think is going to put him in difficult situations. The air raid offense is designed to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands quickly and two receivers in space. They're going to spread the field horizontally, but they're also going to spread the field vertically. And I think this sets up perfectly for what JT Daniels wants to be. I think this offense is going to make some noise. I really believe it. And they'll have a great, difficult test there in the backyard brawl in week number one. All right, moving on to number two. Can Sean Clifford 
shake off the struggles from the second half of last season and exercise some demons of of the few previous seasons. Well, let's we got to cut the 2021 season in half for the most part because prior to the injury, Clifford was playing excellent football. He was on a roll. I mean, he really was. The guy had 11 touchdowns against just five interceptions. He had also contributed more than I ever thought he would on the ground. The guy ran for almost 175 yards on 44 attempts. It's about four yards a carry. Then factor in the sacks. Actually, was a very, very productive runner for Penn State prior to the injury. And then, of course, the running game went away completely after that injury against Iowa. And his accuracy just wasn't quite the same down the stretch. Now, we had him on the show earlier in the fall. And he kind of talked about the struggles and the challenges and the fact that he just didn't feel anything like himself down the stretch. Now, I think they have a difficult test. We all know about Purdue. We know they're the spoiler makers. We know they have to replace George Karloftis. Maybe they won't be quite as good on defense as they were a year ago. That's a possibility. They also lost their defensive coordinator. And I think the personnel is solid, but a little bit unspectacular. So if Sean Clifford's going to come out of the gate strong, he better because there are question marks a little bit about this Penn State secondary. I think Manny Diaz will come after the quarterback and make life difficult on Aiden O'Connell, but I wouldn't be shocked if this game became a high-scoring affair. So you better hope if you're Penn State, and you better hope that your sixth-year senior quarterback looks a lot more like the guy that he was in the first half of last season and not the second half of last season. All right, moving on to number three. How does Derek Mason fill the void at D.C. for Oklahoma State? Well, we know that this is a significant void. Jim Knowles has been the talk of the offseason. I don't think I've ever, and I don't know about you guys, I don't know if I've ever spent as much time talking about a defensive coordinator in the offseason as I have about Jim Knowles and him taking over at Ohio State. We'll get to them tomorrow, by the way, as we preview some of the biggest games of the weekend. But these are significant shoes that Derek Mason's stepping into. Now, we know he's an experienced coordinator. He's done a good job at every stop he's had. Even at Vanderbilt, sure, there were some years where they weren't as good on defense, but most of Vanderbilt's struggles came when they couldn't score enough points in the SEC to remain competitive. Still took him to a couple bowl games, so I would view his tenure as a glowing success. <laughs> I know you'll say, what? A couple bowl games at Vanderbilt? It's pretty dang good. So you look at what Oklahoma State had last year. They were number three nationally in total defense. They allowed just 273 yards a game. It's the fifth fewest rushing yards per game, just 89 yards a game, and the 10th fewest passing yards per game. When you're that good against the run and that good against the pass, that tells you you're doing everything right, naturally, right? They also, of course, did a great job in making sure teams got off the field without scoring touchdowns. They allowed less than 17 points a game. So they had a bunch of underclassmen returning, though. And it if you read the press clippings and you read what Derek Mason said, 85% of this defense is carryover from last year. That's the terminology. That's the scheme. Of course, he'll had a wrinkle or two, and he's always prided himself on doing a bunch of different things defensively. So I would expect much of the same, but there will be a decent amount of carryover. As far as the personnel is concerned, that's where it all starts on defense. If you got great players, it's pretty easy to call good defense. So they have good players. There were certain turns, several underclassmen, including freshman defensive end Colin Oliver who led the team last year with 11 and a half sacks and 15 and a half tackles for loss. You look in the back end, Jason Taylor there at safety, one of the best interception ball hawking safeties in the land and a sophomore defensive back in Corey Black, who led Oklahoma State with three fumble recoveries. This is going to be attacking style defense. They're going to try to dictate, and I would anticipate Derek Mason doing much of the same as what Jim Knowles did. This is a great offseason hire for Mike Gundy as his staff, because to replace Jim Knowles is an almost impossible task. But I think you went with a guy that is certainly one of the next best in line as what he's accomplished over the course of his tenure. So a great hire for Oklahoma State. And I would expect maybe not equal results to last year because they lost some good pieces, but they'll be comparable to what they did last year on the defensive side. All right. Question four, what's the one-two punch look like for Michigan State at running back? Thunder and lightning. <laughs> Those are their words, not mine. You have Berger, who has turned heads throughout the course of fall camp. And the first scrimmage, usually when the defense is ahead of the offense, he averaged over five yards to carry. That's against a stout defense that is always going to pride themselves and stop at the run. We know about Michigan State's pass defense. That's a conversation for a different day. But if you average over five yards to carry against that defense, that's pretty dang solid. That's what Mel Tech Tucker said about Berger there in the first scrimmage. So you look at what he can provide with a downhill physical style rushing attack. Then you complement him with Jarek Broussard. And 
look, last year was a little bit of a difficult gauge for what Jarek Broussard was at Colorado. He really wasn't that great. The team really wasn't that great either. But if you go back to 2020 in the pandemic shortened season, he averaged 163 yards a game. It was third in the FBS and on just 156 carries, he went for nearly 900 yards with five touchdowns. The first team all Pac-12 running back and the first offensive player of the year award and an honorable uh, honorable All-American team mention. <laughs> so he did a lot there in 2020 and was a big reason why Colorado had a surprisingly good year in first year head coach Carl Durrell's opening season back in 2020. He's got a lot of twitch. I think he also will contribute some in the passing game. And I would expect when Berger's in the game, it's going to be downhill. When you get Broussard in the game, it's going to be more on the perimeter. And they're not the only two, by the way. We say one-two punch. It might be a three-four punch in addition to that because they have some veteran guys and a guy or two that was young that has kind of blossomed and is starting to make some waves coming out of camp there at Michigan State. So I am not at all concerned about replacing Kenneth Walker. And if you were to talk chalk up back in January, hey, biggest concerns for teams going into 2022. Replacing Kenneth Walker would have been near the top of the list. It's not anymore. I think they're deep. I think they're versatile. And I'm not sure this run game will skip a beat, knowing that it might be by committee, but they should be able to replicate some of the success, especially knowing that the passing attack will likely improve and defenses will have to respect that a little bit more with the advancement of their quarterback, Peyton Thorne, and the explosive weapons that they have on the outside. All right, number five. Got a few options here. Who's going to start at quarterback for TCU? <laughs> well, if you listen to Sonny Dykes, he's going to play three. I've heard of a one-headed monster at quarterback. I've even heard of a two-headed monster at quarterback. See Michigan. But a three-headed monster, that's different. <laughs> that's very, very different. Let's go to the candidates. Max Duggan, he started 29 games at TCU and has done a pretty dang good job. The guy was the former Iowa Gatorade Player of the Year coming out of high school, was a four-star recruit, and threw for nearly 6,000 yards and 41 touchdowns in the 32 games that he's played for the Horned Frogs. He also has beaten Texas a couple times, and he's not just a pocket passer. The guy's rushed for nearly 1,500 yards and 19 touchdowns. So he can contribute not just with his arm, but also with his legs. Has had a little bit of a checkered past from an injury standpoint, which is unfortunate. And that's partly why I think this is a competition because if it weren't for his injury history, he would likely be the starting quarterback for TCU as Sonny Dykes takes over there in Fort Worth. The guy that he's competing against, and I know, look, all due respect, the third quarterback on the list, I'm not going to include him in this discussion because I think it comes down to one of two guys. It's going to be Max Duggan, the aforementioned Max Duggan, or Chandler Morris. And Chandler Morris, he... Obviously, in one game last year prior to the injury against the Big 12 champs, the Baylor Bears, he was sensational. Absolutely sensational. Threw for 461, added another 70 on the ground, even caught a pass in that game. 531 total yards of offense, second most in school history, and it was unfortunate that he was lost the next game. But Chandler Morris comes to TCU as one of the most highly regarded prospects that they've ever had at quarterback there in Fort Worth. So I think ultimately it's going to end up being Morris. He's still a redshirt freshman. They were able to preserve his redshirt status last year because he played in less than four games. Still a redshirt freshman. And knowing that it's a new regime, I think going with the younger player, if it's a photo finish and you're trying to kind of figure out who's going to who's gonna be there, even if it's a photo finish, you might lean just ever so slightly in favor of the guy who has a longer runway meaning more years of eligibility remaining. So I think Chandler Morris will ultimately be the guy, but it'll be interesting to see how they divvy up the reps against Colorado, where they're a two-touchdown favorite, and that line has just taken off. They were a touchdown favorite to open. Now it's a two-touchdown favorite. So it'll be really interesting, I think, to see one of the sleeper teams, one of my sleeper teams, TCU, to see what they do at quarterback. It's a quarterback-friendly offense, so regardless of who it is, I think they'll have success and the stats will back it up. But staying healthy is going to be of the utmost importance because both these guys have had their fair share of struggles in that regard. All right, moving on to number six. And luckily for the Wolfpack, this game's at noon. But the question remains, how will NC State handle the expectations heading into a hostile environment at East Carolina? Look, I've, I think NC State falls in the category, Coops, of one of those teams that's really, really dangerous 
when no one's talking about them. We've already talked about this is their highest preseason ranking in 20 years nearly. So it's been a while since NC State's had this level of expectation heading into the season. And if you want to talk about Greenville, North Carolina, the Dowdy Ficklin Stadium environment is insane. The Purple Haze will get going. It'll be rocking. They'll be going absolutely nuts to welcome in to their house a top 13 ranked team. How good has NC State been under Dave Dorn? Okay. If you want to know specifically, they have the second most wins of any ACC program over the last eight years. Of course, Clemson has the most, but NC State, second most wins in the ACC, and it might be their best team yet. Their offense gets back Devin Leary, who I think has a chance to work behind an offensive line that's veteran and experienced and physical. I would expect Leary to be the best version of himself here in 2022, but I don't think we should overlook what they bring back on defense too. They bring back eight starters and they have a couple of guys that were injured last year that are back or at least close to being back to 100%. So if you look at this NC State, NC State team and the roster, they are going to be ridiculously competitive, but they better be careful. I'm not picking an upset here. I'm not. All I know is that when I watch East Carolina, they have some athletes on the perimeter. They have a veteran quarterback that's big and physical and can create on his own. The guy he reminds me of, if you haven't watched East Carolina, watch Virginia. Their quarterback is awfully similar to Brennan Armstrong, and Brennan Armstrong has sneaky All-American potential. So watch East Carolina. Watch their perimeter weapons. Watch how disruptive they can be. They're undersized up front, but they're athletic up front. So this is a tricky game because it's one of those games where if they beat East Carolina, everyone's going to say, all right, well, no worries. They should beat East Carolina. But those that know this rivalry, those that have lived in the state like I have in Charlotte, North Carolina, you understand what this game means to the Pirates and how they're going to come out guns ablazing to try to knock off and make a statement there in week one against a team with massive expectations and a pretty significant burden heading into the season. All right, number seven, can Cincy hold up in the trenches against the pit boss and his hogs? Let's talk first about their offense, okay? Because Desmond Ritter, Jerome Ford, Alec Pierce, all those guys are gone. They were obviously the main features of how they could attack and how they could try to create opportunities in one-on-one coverage on the outside. Ritter was excellent. Jerome Ford was really good and decisive between the tackles and on the perimeter. And Alec Pierce was a matchup nightmare for any corner <laughs> in college football. All right, the offense might have lost a ton of firepower, but they bring back a ton along the offensive line. The defense loses a lot of their top, in, in name alone, really, their top playmakers. Yes, they lose four guys that were drafted on the defensive side. They lose six guys overall that were drafted in the first 109 picks. It's not easy for a team like Cincinnati that's a developmental program. It's become more of a destination, but it's still a developmental program. It's going to be difficult, I think, to replace some of those key pieces. But this is a deep team. They got a ton of guys into the mix last year. The linebacking core loses the top two tacklers, but Deshaun Pace is back after earning all conference honors last year. And they're not exactly starting from scratch. I think the secondary is a concern. So can they hold up in the trenches? We know it didn't go well for them when they played against Alabama in the semifinal. They couldn't hold up. Alabama's physicality, Alabama's size, and their ability to just lean on Cincinnati took its toll from the start of the game until the very end of the game. Really had no answer for Brian Robinson and that Alabama rushing attack. Well, in comes Arkansas. Arkansas has a physical quarterback and KJ Jefferson that is also a huge contributor in the run game. They have three running backs, all of which will get plenty of opportunities to create for themselves, but they might go with a hot hand approach. And they have some question marks on the perimeter outside, but Jaden Hazelwood, a lot of people feel really good about what he might do in this receiving core, trying to fill in for a significant void that Traylon Burks leaves. Now he's with the Tennessee Titans. So I look at this team and knowing that you have to replace two elite corners in Kobe Jones and Sauce Garner, excuse me, Kobe Bryant and Sauce Garner. Those are two guys that are going to be very difficult to replace. But is Arkansas equipped to take advantage on some of the downfield throws that they're likely going to have to try because you know this Cincinnati defense has heard all offseason about selling out against the run? They got pushed around. They can't get run on like that. I guarantee their entire offseason has been spent trying to become more physical so that they can hold up in the trenches against SEC and top-level competition. 
which means there's going to be an opportunity on the outside, perhaps, to win over the top. And it's going to be up to those new corners to step into those spots to replace the NFL draftees in Sauce Gardner and Kobe Bryant. So my concerns with Cincinnati aren't necessarily in the front seven defensively. They're actually more on the perimeter. That's where they might be challenged against the Hawks. All right, you ready for this one at number eight? I am. Will Grayson McCall be able to find success against Andre Carter in Army with all the new faces surrounding him? That's right, folks. It's Coastal Carolina Army breakdown. Take it. What do you have? <laughs> this is a great game, actually. A really, really good game. Two teams that I think will be will eclipse the double-digit win mark this year. Army, of course, excellent, always. But Coastal Carolina, ever since what they did a couple years ago, nobody's taking them lightly. Grayson McCall is back, but who's he throwing to? You lose Javian Hiley, he was he's gone. That was their leading receiver last year. And I think their best matchup weapon last year was Isaiah Likely. He was their tight end. He's now playing for the Baltimore Ravens. So they have a pretty good running back in Braden Bennett, who comes back as their leading pass catcher from a year ago, but he only had 24 catches. No one else has really caught more than six passes. So it's not like they bring back a ton of experience on the perimeter. They have a veteran quarterback, and his presence will make the other players that will be catching the football better, but will they be good enough to take advantage knowing that there's going to be a pass rush that you referenced with Andre Carter coming off the edge that likely to breathe a little fire? They can run the football, and I think they have a chance along the offensive line to be really good. Willie Lampkin's back at guard. He's an all-star. The guy has a chance to be an all-conference performer. Wouldn't be shocked if his name becomes a little bit more of a hot name as the season rolls along. But they lost their leading rusher, and I'm a little bit concerned about whether or not Braden Bennett can appropriately replace Shamari Jones, who was a guy that obviously did an awful lot for him in the run game last year. So it'll be really interesting to see how they distribute the ball. Grayson McCall is going to be great. I expect him to be fantastic, but you know what it's like to play against Army. You might only possess the ball for 18 to 22 to 24 minutes. You better make those possessions count. So if for whatever reason, the first couple possessions, they're just not all the way cranked up. Maybe they're not all the way dialed in. Maybe they're missing on some easy throws. Maybe they're missing on some timing throws. That could be problematic because you know Army is just going to churn and burn every single time they have the football. So a difficult matchup, I think, for Coastal in this one. I lean just ever so slightly in favor of Army, and I'm not sure a lot of people would agree with me on that. All right, number nine. LSU has the talent. We all know that. But do they now have the right leader? No doubt. A lot of people have mocked Brian Kelly all offseason. A lot of people have said how bad of a fit he was. But here's been my pushback with Brian Kelly's hire. Is they just had the best fit ever at LSU. A guy that was from Louisiana. That had every relationship that you could possibly manufacture in the state of Louisiana and at Ogeron. And it was a remarkable failure the last couple of years. Brian Kelly, say what you want about his tenure at Notre Dame, his inability to get over the hump at Notre Dame. But he got him there, got to the national championship, got to the playoff on multiple different occasions, has kind of reinvented himself a time or two. And if you say anything about Brian Kelly is that he's just not a great fit. Well, let me tell you what a great fit is at LSU. It's a guy that wins. Because last time I checked... When a guy that coached at Toledo and Michigan State decided to head on down to the Bayou, he won a lot of games. His name was Nick Saban. Wasn't a great fit from West Virginia. But guess what? Gets down to LSU. He wins. He all of a sudden becomes a great fit. It doesn't matter. The fit doesn't matter. All that matters is winning. And at LSU, they have the pieces right now to get the job done. And if you look at how they played down the stretch last year... All was not lost. These guys played pretty hard. They were young in spots, maybe not as talented as they've been at other times, but they're excellent at wide receiver, teetering on the edge of elite. I think they have excellent, excellent personnel along the front defensively. It's a pretty good place to start. They've gotten away from who they've been in the past. They don't run the ball with the same level of efficiency. I don't think the offensive line is as good as it once was. There are questions surrounding the quarterback spot, even though I think Jaden Daniels, if he is the guy, and I expect him to be the guy, I think he has a chance to kind of revitalize his career and finally reach the potential that he's always had. And then in the back end, back end of the secondary, they're not as good at corner as they usually are. All those things considered, Brian Kelly is not going to put his team in position to be unsuccessful. He knows where they're weak. He knows where they might struggle. 
And he will make sure he will do everything from his point of view as the head coach and in line with the coordinators to make sure that the perceived weaknesses on this team don't bite him. Brian Kelly beats teams he's better than. He might lose to teams where his personnel is not as good, but more often than not, if it's comparable or if they're better than that, better than the team they're playing against, they win. That's a sign of a good coach. Now, ultimately, he's got to get over the hump. Only one thing will lead for me to say that this is a successful hire and that's winning a national championship. Will they do it in 2022? I don't think so. But will they do it at some point in the next five years? I think it's a very real possibility. That's how much faith I have in Brian Kelly and his process and his attention to detail and his ability to get his team prepared on a week-to-week basis where they're going to play at a consistently high level of football regardless of who the opponent is. All right, and the last one, last question, what we want to see, questions we have for week one. Can Oklahoma's offense pick up where it left off under Lincoln Riley? Well, we haven't had this discussion at all, have we? If not for the conversation that's centered around Jim Knowles, has there been another coordinator that's been talked about more than Jeff Levy this offseason? <laughs> Jeff Levy now comes in as we call on the plays for the Oklahoma Sooners. You got to think with their structure, Venables is coaching the defense. Levy's the head coach of the offense. It's as simple as that. You look at what he did at Ole Miss. Granted, he had great personnel, but they were 12th in the nation in rushing, and they were 118th in time of possession. What does that tell you? Tempo, 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 tempo. This is a style of offense that has traditionally worked extremely well in the Big 12. Baylor's used it with success back in the Art Bryles era. We've seen it used at times with Texas Tech. We've seen it used at times with Oklahoma when they were hyper-tempo. We've seen it used all over the place in the Big 12. And more often than not, it's been successful. He's got an experienced quarterback in Dylan Gabriel, who I have a ton of of faith in. I think he's going to do a great job. Yes, I'm going to miss seeing Caleb Williams if I'm an Oklahoma Sooner fan for sure. But man, we're in a pretty good spot with Dylan Gabriel. He's played a ton of football. And if he can stay healthy, they have a chance to, I think, be one of the best offenses, not just in the Big 12, but in all of college football. Can't play quarterback by yourself. Well, the good news is he doesn't have to. Marvin Mims is back. Theo Weiss is back. And I think you have a running back in Eric Gray that is a perfect fit for what this offense intends to be. He's not going to be a churn and burn, a physical dude that's going to get downhill and break through tackles, but he's going to be a speedy weapon that can contribute in the passing game. And if they get favorable numbers, he could take it the distance at the drop of a hat. I think this offense isn't going to skip a beat. At the offensive line, hopefully they're more physical than they've been in the last couple of years because I've been somewhat unimpressed with that group relative to what they were back in 2017 when they were mauling folks all over the yard. I'm very optimistic about this offense. I actually think in some ways it might be better than last year. It might be more consistent than last year. Does that ultimately lead to more victories? Let's hope. But I also think too, what they're stepping into, it's not a complete rebuild. They're in a great spot with capable weapons, with an established identity, with an elite offensive coordinator that's going to be pulling the strings throughout the course of the season. All right, clearly a lot of questions that need to be answered here in week number one of the college football season. The good news is we have to wait just a little bit over 24 hours until we start to get some of those questions answered. So excited about this week. I know you are too. As college football fans, this is the week that we've been dreaming of with just one more sleep, as I like to tell my three and a half year old, one more sleep until we have all the football we could possibly consume. But if you want to consume some football tonight, or if you want to consume an amazing episode of Eli's Places, you got to check it out. And this time, Eli visits with what I think is the greatest player ever to wear the scarlet and gray. That's why Orlando Pace can be a dominating blocker. He can keep his feet moving and knock you on your butt. Do you know how many pancake blocks you got your senior year? I believe it was around 80. That is correct. The pancake counter, as well as magnets sent to voters, helped the pancake man finish fourth in Heisman voting in 1996, a rare feat for a player in the trenches. Orlando Pace, the junior left tackle for Ohio State, considered perhaps the best ever at his position. Orlando Pace, 6'6", 330 pounds. He's the big guy who has been advertised so much for the Heisman Trophy. 
the winner of the 1996 Heisman Trophy, Danny Warfield, University of Hawaii. He got fourth place in the Heisman. That's pretty good. Peyton got eighth place. I've never let him forget that. I bring that up to him a lot. Orlando, I hear you're sick of the, uh, the Tyler giving you pancake, and I thought, you know, as many times as people have mispronounced my name, we could go in together and uh, maybe go into waffles and uh, get something going. Despite his fourth place Heisman finish, the Pancake Man was the first pick in the 1997 NFL Draft and went on to a Hall of Fame career in the pros. I don't think that many people that are my age, uh, I'm 34, those that are maybe younger than me have any understanding of just how dominant Orlando Pace was. I mean, we're talking about a complete man amongst boys at every level of football, by the way. I'm not talking about like just in college. I'm talking about every level of football. It didn't matter who was in front of him. He was going to dominate. What an unbelievable player. And it's great to hear that story. 80 pancake blocks in a season. Are you kidding me? I remember like this is the, by the way, this is like a total like right hand turn. I apologize in advance. Uh, this is like the night Wednesday before week one when I as the quarterback would always take the offensive lineman out to eat. It was like our annual tradition on Wednesday before week one because all the hay was in the barn at the for the most part on the Wednesday leading up to the Saturday game. And I remember those. It was almost like a competition to see how much guys could eat. And it was beyond obnoxious. Uh, I don't know if 80 pancakes could be consumed at offensive line dinner, but I think many of my teammates would have tried if we had gone to perhaps a breakfast place. But this is always a fun night that I always look forward to to interact with the offensive line. And it was part of our team building and make sure, hey, the fastest way to an offensive lineman's heart is through his stomach. So you got to make sure those guys. Oh, I got to ask you. I got to ask you about that, Mac. Yes. Right? Was it the whole team, not just the starters? How many guys were you taking out? And no, what was the total it's bill? The top 10. around. It's the top ten. So for one and two deep. You, if you were the third string, you're out. Sorry. Like if you have to play and you're a third string lineman, like we got problems. Okay, no disrespect. Like we got major issues. So I, we always limited it just to the top ten because I think it was a karma thing. It's like if we feed the third string, maybe they'll play, and like we don't want that, you know. So, <laughs> so it was always the top ten offensive linemen, and the bill was always pretty extravagant. The, the not to the extent like you see these rookie dinner bills where they're in the thousands and tens of thousands. No, it was never like that. It was like three hundred dollars, but three hundred dollars back then, it was a fortune. Like I had to save up all summer long, and my dad split it with me. So that you know, full disclosure. Uh, that was his contribution to making sure his son was safe. Uh, but uh, you get your scholarship check in the summer. And I remember taking a little bit and pushing it to the side there in June and July, and maybe having a little left over from the bowl game the year before. And it was all gone in, in the blink of an eye. So like three or 400 bucks, which for 10 guys, pretty good. Granted, I got to choose the restaurant and I chose a place where you can get two for one on sides of fries and milkshakes and all that other stuff. So, you know, let's say that's the way it works. Plus kids eat free and some of the guys were freshmen. So like they're basically kids. Uh, you know, it was a good, it was a good. Tell you what, the NIL deal, these old linemen are about to make out real good on tonight <laughs> if they're going out to dinner. All right. That's 300, $400 a plate. Now. Yeah. I think the NIL deal now, how that's changed. Um, I actually think some of the guys, their rookie meal when they get to the league will be worse than their college meal that they could have tonight. And then the day's, leading up to tonight. So some guys go last weekend. We always went the Wednesday before the first game, and it was a really good experience for us to kind of spend time together. Uh, and we never talked about the game either. Everyone's like, oh, did you guys talk about the plan? I was like, heck no. <laughs> like, <laughs> if we're talking about the plan on Wednesday before the game on Saturday, after we've run through three weeks of training camp, like something's gone horribly wrong. Uh, but no, it was always a fun night, and that was usually tonight. So tip of the cap to the all the offensive linemen that are getting to eat on their quarterback's dime right now. I hope that you're treated well, and I hope that uh, your stomachs are full as you put your head on the pillow tonight. Look, great, great, great conversation there about offensive linemen. Let's fast forward, though. We told you it's going to be some huge stats. We just talked about Orlando Pace, 80 pancakes. Who keeps track of that, by the way? Like, we're the offensive line gurus that are tracking pancakes. And what constitutes a pancake, too, by the way? Like, if the defender falls down, is that a pancake? I don't know. I don't have time for offensive line stats, all right? Collectively, we grade the offensive line as a whole, not individual performance, but Orlando Pace... He could have as many pancakes as he wanted. The guy could dominate any, anybody. But here's some impressive stats that jumped out to us as we were kind of navigating the landscape over the last couple of days in preparation for week one. Appalachian State, they'll be hosting UNC. 
They have 21 guys that are fifth or sixth year players. 21 guys that are fifth or sixth year players. Now, what does that mean for their performance against North Carolina? I, I'm not sure, but it's a veteran group. Clearly, they played a lot of football. They understand what it takes to be successful against a Power 5 team. And I can promise you, they will not at all be phased whatsoever when North Carolina heads to the Rock. Uh, I would imagine that App State will be playing right up to the whistle every single snap and maybe flirt with some things after the whistle. It's a fun group to watch. Uh, and I think that that game is going to be hotly contested one there from Boone, North Carolina. And then here is the other stat that made us scratch our head. Do you realize that the longest win streak in the country resides in Lafayette, Louisiana? That's right. And not just by a little bit. They have by far the longest win streak in the country. Of course, we know they lost week one last year to Texas. They went on to rip 13 straight, which gives them a little bit of a roll here into the 2022 season. Clemson, of course, finished very strong. Baylor as well. Uh, and then Central Michigan, another one that I was not expecting, fighting Jim McElwain's. They won that bowl game last year in impressive fashion. Remember, the, the their bowl game got canceled. They got rescheduled, went and played another one. It was pretty neat how that all set up. And they, of course, were victorious. They're in the postseason. So five teams or four teams that you probably didn't think about when thinking about the longest win streaks in college football. Will they live on until week two of the season? Look, thanks for being with us. We really appreciate it. We have so much more to get to tomorrow, previewing some of the biggest games of the weekend. We'll get with Chris the Bear Felica on Friday, we'll talk about some of the biggest games as it pertains to the line and the spread. So a lot that we still have to do here this week as we get you set or week one of the college football season. For all of us here at Always College Football, please like, rate, and subscribe, whether it's on the ESPN YouTube channel or if it's on the podcast, Apple Podcast or Spotify. Like, rate, and subscribe. Tell your friends too, because word of mouth is huge for us as we're trying to grow and build this thing from the bottom. We appreciate you though, that's for sure. For all of us here at Always College Football, he's Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.